thank you. Uh, thank you for also uh, having an English speaker here because that allows me to speak English. Uh, I am a native German. Uh, most of you know that, but talking about these topics in German is a bit cumbersome because uh, I'm not doing it that often and all the vocabulary is English anyway. So this is why English is preferred for me anyway. Um, so who here knows me and knows what I do? And uh, who knows what TypeSafe is and what TypeSafe does? Okay, so I don't really need to, to say what that means. Uh, just uh, let me say that it's awesome that uh, TypeSafe lets me work on open source software and that's all what I always dreamt of. So um, that's uh, about it to my uh, role. I'm the ACA tech lead, but I'm not talking about ACA today, which is a bit strange. But I'm talking about another project uh, that I've been doing, and that is a book called Reactive Design Patterns. This book is um, coming out um, at Manning. It's in the Manning Early Access Program right now. Uh, all chapters are basically written um, out for final review, and then there will be copy editing and all that jazz. Uh, so it will probably take another three, four months before the final version comes out, but um, well, it's nearly done. So whew, it has taken like two and a half years to get to this point, so I was quite glad um, beginning of January when I reached that. So there's the code 39 KUHN for 39% off. I'm told there's uh, even a better code that gives you 45% off at the TypeSafe site, so you can use that if you want. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm talking about this book, but I'm not going to present the whole, the whole uh, set of topics because that would be way too much. Uh, this presentation is, is a bit scalable, just like we want software to be. Uh, and I'll just pick some highlights and talk about these um, as, they, as they are described in the book. In the book, they, they are described in more detail as well. Uh, so I'll just shine us through uh, a few spotlights. Um, first part of the book, just like the first part of the presentation, is about what is reactive. And then I'll talk about patterns later. So who here uh, has read the, the reactive manifesto? I guess everyone. Normally the, the, it comes back with like one third or so, <laughs> but the, due to the name of this meetup, I, I expect everyone to have read it. So I can be really quick about this. Um, we have two mo main motivating factors. At least that's how I view it. I presented it slightly differently here from, from what the Reactive Manifesto shows today. Uh, perhaps we'll change it at some point. So the first one is el elasticity. Um, we consider a system, uh, we want to write an internal system or an external facing application, whatever it is, it's some sort of system. And when we design it, we design it from the ground up to be elastic which means that it needs to be scalable. We need to be able to add and remove nodes to add to and remove from the capacity of the system to cope with varying load. This is what elasticity is about. Um, now, a, a criticism that frequently is mentioned, um, especially by people writing like small to medium business uh, software in Germany is, we don't have this need to go infinitely scalable. Uh, we are not Twitter, so why is this relevant at all? Um, I will try to answer that question. So when we design a system um, to be el uh, elastic, what does that mean? Uh, what are we required to do? We need to be able to split the work such that more nodes can participate and add the, their capacity together um, so that we can, we can handle, in principle, infinite load. This means that we need to be able to split up the work and distribute it. We need to write our system such that it can be dis distributed across a set of nodes. And this is the crucial point. It's not that we need to be able to deploy to all of Amazon EC2, but we need to write the application such that it can, in principle, be distributed. Um, we will see what that gives us. Um, well, if we don't require scale. If we require scale, then it's quite obvious that this is needed. The other one, the other main motivating factor is resilience. What happens if something goes wrong? Everybody knows that things can go wrong. And the only, the only answer to this, again, is that we need to avoid putting all uh, eggs in one basket. Again, we need to distribute. We need to 
uh, place the functionality that we want to execute in different places that might be separated by JVM boundaries, by machine boundaries, in different data centers, it doesn't really matter. The point is it needs to be at separate locations, it needs to be distributed, because otherwise a single failure can knock out the whole system. This again has implications on how you write your system. We will encounter um, examples that are more concrete during the patterns part, uh, especially when it comes to replication of state. But um, resilience requires us to think about how we can make it so that state is kept in two places. Uh, and when one goes down, the whole system still keeps functioning. That's resilience. Most people um, that provide services on the internet need resilience uh, because they need their site to be always up 24 seven. And uh, this American phenomenon of uh, Black Friday, this specific day is, is the uh, litmus test normally. So the systems need to stay up always, otherwise you lose money. That's the thing. But if you design an application that is not offered to the internet, um, then you might not have the problem at the same scale. But still, you always have requirements about the uptime of your application. And you cannot, um, you cannot make it resilient without distributing. And distribution is something that we want. Now, if we take these two as a given, so we want elasticity, we want resilience, then we have a few follow-on observations that we can make. The first result is the one that is stated in the reactive manifesto today, and that is responsiveness. We want our system to respond, uh, even under varying load, and under failure conditions, so when parts of it fail. Uh, that's very clear, and that's, that's a property that many people like uh, about software, but there are others. In order to achieve resilience, we need to compartmentalize our software. We need to decouple the different pieces from each other such that a failure of one does not knock down all the others in a kind of domino effect. So we need to contain failures. Uh, we need to compartmentalize and encapsulate them. Uh, this means also that we need to be more um, deliberate in our interfaces, in what we expose. We need to encapsulate the functionality that is um, implemented inside a module and think more clearly about the boundaries where influences to other systems can leak out. Which means uh, this um, desire to contain failure leads us, guides us to a design that is naturally more decoupled. The same is true for designing for infinite scalability because you will notice as soon as you try to scale something uh, that if you need to coordinate, uh, you have contention on certain things that you need to keep consistent in the system. If they are shared, uh, that will always be a bottleneck. And if you design for infinite scalability, you remove these bottlenecks, which means removing coupling, decoupling the components in a better way. Ideally, it's a shared nothing architecture. And the benefit is that we have these clear boundaries. We have another uh, result uh, that we get from this, and that's um, if you have these clear boundaries of parts of your system and you have very clear it interfaces with protocols in between them, uh, then you can more easily split the work across multiple teams. You can develop it uh, independently. You can develop the different parts of your system at their own pace. This is the whole microservices story. We'll talk about the single uh, responsibility principle uh, later as well. Um, so this all ties together in that you ha have a better structure for developing and maintaining your projects and uh, you gain more flexibility in what you, if, if you need to change something because the unit of change is small and contained ideally. Uh, I mean, there will always be situations where you need to change the design of a system, but uh, at least, um, so we'll, we'll talk about that in, uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, how you go about this. Um, so these are the results that I want to mention. There is one observation here. If we want to decouple parts of the system, uh, we need to somehow make it so that not one 
synchronously and tightly ties into the other and gets hooked. And this is why, um, this is the only reason why the manifesto states message driven as one of the four tenets. It is an observation that we make that um, focusing on the interchange of information in a, in, in a sense that is completely asynchronous is what, it was, what allows us to implement this decoupling, what al allows us to implement systems that are scalable, resilient, and so on. We need this fundamental notion of I send a message and it gets transported somewhere else and I do not synchronously wait for anything to come back because this could be on the other side of the ocean. I don't want to be coupled to all the things that can go wrong in between on the path. This means that message-driven, uh, asynchronous message delivery between components is a key factor here. It's uh, something that you will see in all reactive systems. Now, it doesn't really matter how you do it. Obviously, uh, I normally use actors for <laughs> no good reason other than I've written a framework, but um, there is also, a, 0MQ, AMQP, there are lots of message brokers that you can use to convey messages. And the point here is that you asynchronously send something like a letter and then someone else picks it up completely independently in a decoupled fashion. And you can do the same using HTTP if you want. Just make sure you, you use an as asynchronous client that uh, doesn't allow the server to block you. Yeah, so we'll go into detail later but this is the overview of, of what this is all about. We'll have two parts. The first one of the remainder, uh, the, the first one is architecture patterns. Um, there won't be any code because it's architecture. And then there are implementation patterns, uh, there will be code. And I guess most of you want the, the, to get to the second part, but first we need to do the first part. So we'll start with the most basic uh, reactive pattern that I can think of, and that's the simple component pattern. A component shall do only one thing, but do it in full. This is uh, basically my short one sentence summary rewording um, of work that, that is really old. Uh, it was published um, in 79 by DeMarco in a book called Structured Analysis and System Specification, which describes in, um, I, I forgot how many hundred pages. So it's, it's a book that is about this topic. Um, and it doesn't have this one catchy phrase in it. Uh, so the, 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 the best one I could find is um, that the goal of this whole exercise is to maximize cohesion and minimize coupling. Uh, that's what we want to achieve. We want to decouple and we want to keep the things together that naturally stick together. Um, there has been a different formulation by Uncle Bob Martin uh, in the prin principles of um, object-oriented design. Or, yeah, that's what, it's, what it stands for. A class should have only one reason to change. That's probably what more people have uh, heard. This single responsibility principle described as what does this mean? It means that uh, we want the end result of our design when we approach a, a task, so write something, we want the end result to be some boxes on a whiteboard and each of these boxes should have a single responsibility. It should own a certain piece of the solution space, of the problem space, that these two should be matched. So, uh, the, the whole system needs to do this, this whole thing, and this aspect here is done by one component, and everything pertaining to this aspect is done by this one component. That's cohesion. And it's completely different from all the other components. That's the minimized coupling part. So there are these components, and there's the space in between in, in which only messages are exchanged, right? Um, so you keep the things together, just like, like galaxy clusters in the universe, and there's lots of empty space between them. We look at this using an example. It's the same example I use in the book, uh, because examples are really hard to come by. Uh, the example is a batch job service. 
A batch job service is something that I am rather familiar with uh, because I did a PhD in high energy particle physics um, between 2000 and 2010, uh, roughly, uh, at a CERN experiment. Uh, we did big data before the, the term was coined. And uh, the thing was, there was this batch system of, it started with 5,000 computers and then it grew and grew. Uh, where you could submit your analysis jobs. They would have a specification of read data from this magnetic tape. Who knows tapes still? And, <laughs> and, uh, and it would then crunch the numbers and come up with a result. Uh, so what you would do is, as a user, submit a job. Then the machine that manages this cluster needs to look at the job and say, this is not asking for too many resources, so I permit it. There are some validation rules. There are some quotas, like this user has already submitted 10,000 jobs today, and that's uh, not cool, for example. <clears throat> yeah, and then, obviously, there is an execution comp component uh, that makes sure that all the things run, and then users want to get the results back. So they want to query the job status uh, and, yeah, look at what happened. Now, let's apply the single responsibility principle to such a system. We already can see that there are two really different concerns. Uh, and that is, on the left hand side we have the clients, they're outside of our system. And on the right hand side we know that we'll need to do some execution. Uh, we need to execute the batch jobs. Uh, that clearly is something that will be different from the rest. Uh, and between that, um, there is coordination to be done. Uh, these tasks need to be validated and so on, scheduled for execution. And uh, if, <clears throat> if I told you, do some coordination, implement coordination, you wouldn't really know what that means. Um, that's, that's, not, that's not a simple component, that's not a single responsibility. Uh, that's not clear enough. So it's pretty obvious that coordination is, is not good. That's not one of the components that we want to be left with in the end. So what we do is we split it up. That's the thing that we need to do here. Uh, we can immediately see there will be one part where we need to talk to clients. And there's another part where we do all the planning and we give the execution component the information on which jobs to run in which order. And these two, they are sufficiently different. Uh, when one goes down, the other doesn't need to go down. The other can happily stay up and running. So they, they might be not the same, they might not be the same component. And then there is another concern. When you submit a job, you get back a job identifier. And when you get that, it's basically a guarantee that the job will be executed. This means that we need to persistently store these job descriptions somewhere. So there will be some need for storage. So let's split it up like that. Uh, we could have um, done, we could have explored different options. For example, putting the storage into the client interface, that would be really simple, right? Um, job comes in, client interface says, persist this, and so on. Um, but that would violate the single responsibility principle. Because now the client interface doesn't have a single responsibility. It doesn't only talk to clients. It also provides the data, the basis of operation for the rest of the system, for the job scheduling. Um, so that, that would be two things. This is why storage is its own little box here. Now, if we look at this and we say write a client interface that's reasonably concrete, uh, you could come up with, I mean, if you know what the batch system is, you could come up with a, with a UI uh, today where you can submit things, control things, look at results. Uh, storage, uh, you install some, whatever the needs of your storage system are. Uh, but job scheduling, yeah, that's not so simple. I mean, we need to validate, we have the quotas, and then we have all these mad scientists that fight over the, the things to run. And if, if that other guy's jobs always get preferred, then I will go to the sysadmin and knock him out or something like that. Uh, I mean, scientists are fierce people. So this is why the job scheduling um, might benefit from becoming even simpler. So what we do is we break it up. We have a validation component um, that uh, looks at the jobs and sees if, if they are acceptable. Then we have a planning component that is really complex and takes into account all these constraints of 
who gets how much of the cluster, uh, which month, and so on. And then we have this overarching responsibility of the scheduling to first be somewhat available for client requests, but also to, be, um, uh, to provide the list of what is to be done to the execution component. And neither the validation subcomponent nor the planning one need to have this job of providing this list. So there is this box of job scheduling here, and we have the subcomponents. Um, what I wanted to demonstrate with this is, I mean, this is, this is now reasonably um, simple. I mean, it's still, not, it's still vastly underspecified. Uh, but you see where the, where the journey goes. And the point here is that the simple component pattern is applied recursively. You split up the pieces of the responsibility of your system that you identify. And if the piece that you, that you get here is still too big, you split it up further. This is important. Equally important is to remember that it is the uh, single responsibility. So there must be a responsibility principle. Um, having trivial components is not the goal. So if you split up, split up, split up, and you make it smaller and smaller, until you end up with something that is just 10 lines of JavaScript, um, well, that's not the goal as well. Um, the components that you arrive at need to have a purpose. They cannot be trivial. So there is a limit to the recursion depth. Is this somewhat clear on the simple component pattern? Yeah? Good. Then, let's go some other place. So the, the ACA team blog is on letitcrash.com, right? We are not that active there anymore because we don't have time to blog, but still. Um, but this, this has been the, the inspiration for Jonas to start the whole project. So it, it's very fitting um, that I call it the let it crash pattern. There might be other um, names that you might choose. The rule here is prefer a full component restart to complex internal failure handling. Yeah? And this is also not new. And uh, not, uh, we didn't come up with it. Uh, it. The more formal description of what I'm referring to is not that old. Um, but the roots of, of this, this whole school of thought are a lot older. It's called Crash Only Software by Candia and Fox. And um, they wrote several papers analyzing the cost of trying to write the perfect system, basically. That's how you could phrase it. And uh, the conclusion is that there are failure modes in software. I mean, we always, we cannot write perfect software. It's impossible. And there will be failure modes um, that are really hard to debug and that are really costly to fix. And there is this point of diminishing returns that you reach at some some value. I mean, it depends on what you do. If you, if you write software for a machine that decides about uh, life and death of a patient, then the threshold will be a lot higher uh, in how far you will go to ensure that the system does the right thing under all sorts of conditions. Uh, but if you just write a normal website, I mean, if it crashes once in a while, it doesn't really matter. The point is, Beyond this point uh, of, of where, where you can um, uh, afford to go, the simplest measure is to not slap another try-catch on it and try to handle things. It's to conclude this component has failed in a fashion that I didn't really foresee. Scrap it, restart it. Yeah? You just completely um, eradicate the failed component state. You start over from something fresh, from something that is a known good state. And that's the point. Because this, uh, if you implement this, that means that you make your components um, kind of aware of this possibility, so they know how to restart from scratch, um, no matter when the restart happens. And if you do that, you protect your component not only against the failure modes that you foresee and that you plan for, but also for others. Not necessarily for all of them, uh, but there is a class that you didn't foresee and that you still handle. 
there are anecdotes uh, uh, from, from ACA systems, uh, from pre-1.0 days even, um, where a betting system was, was built and there was this actor that failed once a day, but people didn't notice for like half a year until someone looked into the logs. The system was functioning fine because the restart cleared out the, the, the wrong condition and everything just kept working. So this does work in, in practice. It's not a panacea, but it's really good uh, if you want to write reliable systems. This has been proven um, first by Erlang. Erlang was um, conceived in 1986 and was used to great effect in um, this legendary um, Ericsson switch. In 1995, they, they uh, started selling it, which has this uptime of nine nines, uh, which means it can fail for 30 milliseconds a year, um, which is only the upper bound because, well, they didn't measure a failure. It just never, never went down. And if you want to build such a system, all the parts need to be at least that reliable, including the software. And the software part has been attributed basically to this design principle and the rock solid Erlang VM and so on. So this is, this is basically where ACA came from. Uh, nowadays, this, has, this principle has been turned around. Kind of, uh, you could call that a pay, pacemaker pattern. Other people call it the chaos monkey. The, the idea is, um, if you need your system to be able to be restarted at any point, because unforeseen things might happen, um, the only way to exercise that is to introduce failures deliberately into the running system uh, just by killing machines, as the uh, Netflix Chaos Monkey does uh, for the Netflix live system. They don't have a staging planet on which they can rent, run this, right? They, they do this on the, on the live system. They switch off a whole availability zone just to check that the failover works, and they do that when they're live. Because there is no non-live system of that scale that they could use to, to simulate it. So um, this is something that is uh, really necessary if you want to build a system that's resilient at scale. And the, the basic um, thing to keep in mind here is build for failure. Trying to avoid failure will always uh, be doomed because we know that things will fail. Uh, if, even if you write perfect software, the hardware will fail or humans will make mistakes. It happens every day. So plan for failure and uh, be happy and uh, do not try to like, walk around it. So this would conclude the first part of the architecture patterns. Uh, I just picked these two. And um, let's go to implementation patterns. Does anyone have any questions, remarks? OK. So the first one is probably boring. Who is using the circuit breaker pattern already? Not everyone. OK, so it's, it's not that boring. Uh, but it's rather popular. Um, protect services by breaking the connection during failure periods is my attempt at doing a one-line summary. Um, this pattern is basically inspired by, but you shouldn't take it too literally, um, by electrical engineering. Uh, the point is, you have one electrical circuit here and another here and then you have a power source, and you put a breaker in between, because if this circuit is misbehaving and drawing too much current, then you rather shut it down so that the rest keeps functioning. Instead of that, it just uh, drains the whole power and nothing works. So that's the basic inspiration. Of course, we don't measure current in, in, a, in a computer system. Um, that's not how things work. You'll see how it works in a second. Uh, but that's the inspiration. It was first published by Michael Nygaard in Release It, um, and then other people have blogged about it as well. So it's not exactly unknown. Um, what is important to consider is that this circuit breaker pattern um, works both ways. So when one service needs to make a call to another service, so it needs to ask for something, and then it waits for some response, asynchronously, of course, at some later time, so you get a future back. Um, if that other service is down, unreachable, overloaded, whatever, currently not deployed, 
whatever the reason is. Typically, um, this message is sent over the network, and sometimes it's answered a few tens or hundreds of milliseconds later by a failure, but sometimes it just doesn't get a response, for example, if the other system is overloaded. And then you need to wait for the timeout period to, to finish, and then you conclude that, oh, I cannot currently make this kind of request. Um, I need to do something else or signal the error upstream or whatever I need to do. Um, if you have a circuit breaker in place, you monitor this relationship and you see, does this work does it, or does this, does this currently not work? And if it has failed sufficiently often, like five times in a row, it has taken too long, then the circuit breaker trips and no calls are actually made. No messages are sent. Um, the, the calling party immediately concludes, before, before even trying it, that this will fail and generates the negative response with zero latency, which means that you can do your degraded performance thing, whatever that is, immediately instead of having to wait. So it protects the client from these wait periods, from these timeouts. They will need to happen a few times, but then it concludes, okay, I, I'm just giving up for like the next 30 seconds. On the other hand, especially if it was an overload situation, the, the, other, the component on the other side is protected by the circuit breaker as well. Because if no requests are made for 30 seconds, then this system will be able to drain its queues and get back to normal working conditions. Um, I mean, we all try to avoid it, but sometimes you make mistakes where the processing latency depends in a non-linear fashion on the queue depth of, the, of certain things. And then it can be really bad, like a self-inflating um, um, problem that only amplifies itself. So if you give the other service some breathing room, it might get back to normal and then everything works again. Uh, on the other hand, it might not. It might be a permanent mismatch, like this service needs more than that can provide. So you need to monitor these circuit breakers and the ops personnel then needs to see, oh, this, this trips from time to time. We need to have, uh, increase the capacity over here so that this doesn't happen anymore. So, but it, it protects the client, it, it protects the service as well. Um, I promised some code and uh, here is some code. It's, it's a bit small. So um, this is, some of you are using circuit breakers. Are you, which ones are you using? Which implementation? The Akka one. one. Yeah, so this is the Akka one. Uh, I mean, there's also uh, a one in, in Hystrix, um, in, the, in the Rx Java um, support libraries. There are other implementations. So this is the Akka implementation. Um, it's used like that. So you create a circuit breaker here with some configuration. It needs a scheduler to be able to run tasks. And then you say if it fails more than five times in 300 milliseconds, then circuit breaker goes open. And then it stays open for 30 seconds. And then it goes half closed and makes a try. And if it works, then it's closed. Uh, if it doesn't, then it's open again. So this is the configuration. And then we have a method that we want to call that returns a future. The ACA one is um, future-based. We have had a contribution for an actor-based one that is in 242 that has just been published uh, a few hours ago. So I guess I'll have to redo this slide at some point. Anyway, um, so we put the call this method into the with circuit breaker method. This is a by name argument. So what you write here is like a lambda expression. It doesn't, it, it is not evaluated right there. Uh, the circuit breaker can decide to not even call this method. If it calls it, it will install some monitoring callbacks on the future. And if it sees um, certain things, um, which is, so when, when this uh, service call fails, we throw this storage failed exception to make the circuit breaker aware that this was a failure. It triggers on all kinds of exceptions. Um, then at some point it will be open and, it would, and, and that means that this send to storage is not even called and immediately we get back a circuit breaker open exception. That's basically all there is to it. It's, uh, it's not a really um, complex or huge API. 
Questions? Remarks? Um, well, yes, uh, you could say so, but it doesn't use the FSM trait. Uh, it uses an atomic integer, I think. But um, yeah, in the end, it implements exactly these three states of closed, half closed, and open. So that's the circuit breaker. Then I have a, a, a rather different topic but one that is interesting, multiple master replication patterns. So I told you, you need to be able to distribute your application, your state. What does that mean? Keep multiple distributed copies, accept updates everywhere, disseminate updates among replicas. That's extremely general. It describes not a solution, but more like a problem space. This is why this is slightly different. Um, it's basically an unsolved problem. Or there are multiple solutions, none of which are perfect. Uh, that depends on, on how you, what kind of person you are, how you want to put it. It's a tough problem, and it always requires trade-offs. And I will talk about uh, the different choices here a bit. If anything is unclear, ask. So, the basic choice that we will see is always between consistency and availability. Uh, some people might scream cap theorem. Um, that is kind of the big hammer uh, with a tiny point. Who here knows about the tiny point? Um, who has read the, the um, paper by Eric Brewer, um, cap theorem 12 years later? I invite everyone to read it. Because the cap theorem itself only excludes a very, very tiny space of this, uh, of this solution diagram between availability and consistency. It only excludes perfect consistency together with perfect availability in the face of network partitions. You can get very close to those. But still, uh, real solutions uh, make you choose, nevertheless. I categorize different solutions in, in these three, three boxes. Uh, first is consensus-based that focuses on consistency. It tries to implement full consistency um, to make uh, the system easy to reason about. I'll go into details. Then we have conflict-free, which is at the opposite side of the spectrum. It focuses on availability. You need to be able to always make changes to the system. The system can never say, I cannot currently accept this update. Um, this has very interesting implications. And then in the middle, we have conflict resolution, which is neither perfectly consistent nor perfectly available, but it's what most systems do. So let's look at them in, in order. Consensus-based. Consensus-based mean that you distribute the data across your replicas, uh, which means you have uh, achieved the goal of having the data not in one place. But every change you do, you need to have full agreement between all the parties before you can process the next thing. This means that someone observing any of the replicas no matter which one they choose, all observers will basically see the system making the same changes in the same order. Uh, this is perfect consistency. Um, this is what we would like to have. The system behaves as if it's one, but it's actually distributed. What this means is that there needs to be constant communication between these parts. Um, if you sever the network communication between them, then they will not be able to communicate and the system will not be able to process updates anymore because it cannot make sure that there is consensus. So this means if you want to have consensus-based replication, so if you use Zookeeper, for example, um, or you use Postgres with um, um, strong serializability um, settings, um, then you accept that the price for having a very high degree of consistency and a simple way of looking at the system is that it can go down. Not only when machines go down, but also when the network goes down. But it behaves just like a single thread. 
So that's extremely simple to explain. The second one is the conflict, conflict resolution one. So we are moving along the scale now, right? Conflict free is the next one. So we are now in the middle, in the gray area. What does the gray area look like? So we replicate and we accept that um, there might not be perfect consensus because we might have had a short net network partition and we accepted some update of some item here and other updates to the same item over here. Now what needs to happen when the network connectivity is restored is that first of all this conflict, the two updates to the same item with different outcome, this conflict needs to be recognized and it needs to be reconciled, so resolved. Um, there, are, there are basically two ways to resolve this conflict. One is one that uh, React did in version one, and that is to present this to the user. Basically to say, I punt on this, um, on this part of the problem. Here, here are the two values that were accepted in the meantime, uh, please reconcile them yourself. This is, this is a bit funny because it places the burden on the user of the system and it's also not really that consistent because different users can see the same conflict and make different decisions again and so on. So it's, the programming model turned out to be um, too complex. Users didn't get it. This is why uh, React switched to another model, the, the third one that I'll talk about. Um, the other one is that the database decides which write wins. Sounds good, doesn't it? It only, the problem is, you have a transaction over here in your Oracle database and the replica over there has a different transaction that updated the same thing and under certain conditions, that this, that's this asterisk you see in the conditions on the website, right? So it guarantees consistency, asterisk. So the, 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 the thing is, under certain network partition conditions, both um, transactions can have completed, committed, but the results of one of them will be partially invalidated. By deciding that they touched the same data item, it can only have one value, we need to pick one. There is, we cannot pick both. So the system will lose rights and it will not be perfectly consistent under all conditions. The thing is, this mostly always works. The, these failure conditions are rare. If you have the thing deployed in a network that is reasonably stable and so on, uh, you might never see such an event. But if you stress the system uh, really a lot, then you will see these, these issues. And it depends whether you can or want to live with them. My point is you need to be aware of this. So the programming model for this is you have these transactions that make you feel like it's a single thread, and that's mostly true, only when it's not. And that's the default configuration you get from most um, database systems. The last choice is the youngest. And th this is really young. So databases are old, 70 years or something. Uh, this is only six or seven years old. The idea here is um, to have data types that you replicate where the data types have um, certain characteristics that make it possible to replicate them without ever running into any conflict. Sounds like magic voodoo, but it's not. Um, I can explain uh, how one such data type works. So the, the goal is you have replicas and you can update at each and every one of them and it doesn't matter whether they are currently connected to each other. As soon as they connect, they will disseminate all the changes and none of the rights will be lost. Does that sound like magic? Who knows how this works? Hands up. That's three, four, okay. So I can explain a counter because that's, um, that's not too complicated. A counter means um, something that I can count up. I can only increment. So the only right that I can do as a client is to say add one or I can add five, that's five times adding one. Um, and I can do that at any replica. Let's say the counter is zero in the beginning. Now I talk to replica A and increment it by five. 
someone else turns to re replica B and increments it by 3. So at replica A, I make a little list that says at A we add 5. And at B, we make a, another li list that says at B, add 3. Now if you read the system at this point, you will see that A will tell you the counter is 5, B will tell you it's 3, and C will tell you it's 0. So the system is not yet consistent. But then they gossip, and they disseminate all this information. And what they do is they merge these tables. C has an empty table, um, B has this B entry, and A has this A entry. Once they have gossiped, so A talks to B, and the entry for A is put into the same table, so it's now A and B, and the same information goes back, and eventually C learns of the same things until everyone has these two entries. So everyone knows that the counter was 5 at A and 3 at B. And the simple solution is, at that point, every of the replicas will tell anyone that asks the counter's value is 8 because you simply sum up the things, right? Now the system is consistent, none of the rights were lost. It doesn't matter whether there was a network partition for some time. Once the systems start talking, they will eventually be consistent. And that's, well, exactly what it is. It's eventually consistent. So you can write these data types. Um, you can express counters that go up. You can also express counters that go down, which is a pair of counters that can both only go up. Only the final value is the difference between them. So you subtract, subtract one from the other. And if you want to subtract, you incre increment the subtraction counter. It works. It takes some space uh, proportional to the number of replica sites and so on. So there's some overhead to it, but it works and it has really nice properties. Uh, you can formulate maps and sets um, of these things. The only thing you cannot easily do is to have something like, like a list because different replicas would need to agree on the order in which things are in the list. So the thing is you cannot express all possible data types. There is a large number that you can express and there's a module in ACA that's called ACA Distributed Data that shows you which ones there are uh, that are currently known and implemented. Um, so you can do lots of things with it, uh, but you need to restrict your, your program a bit. But if you do that, then you have a system that's perfectly available, and it's eventually consistent. Eventually consistent only means that it may take some time to become consistent, but it's still it will be consistent given enough time and network availability. This is an extremely different programming model, and it's explicitly distributed at the core. So it has this concern really built in and attacks it like from the front instead of trying to say, mm, let's fool people into thinking that there is a single thread when there isn't. Uh, so I, I find this the most honest solution, but sometimes you can't use it and then you need to fall back to the others. It's always about requirements. I am a firm believer in using the right tool for the job. But now at least you know. So these are the three basic ones. Um, no size fits all, and you really need to think. It's, I mean, non-obvious. The last pattern that I will talk about is the saga pattern. Divide long-lived distributed transactions into quick local ones with compensating actions for recovery. There's a problematic thing here in this sentence, and that's distributed transaction. Distributed transactions, who here loves them? No, they, they don't really work. That's, uh, that's known. Um, they have all these problems that, I mean, we basically talked about it um, during the replication just now. Uh, if you want to have consensus, then it won't work sometimes, and otherwise you have these holes when it's not consistent. So. Yeah, distributed transactions are not really the answer. Now, it becomes even more problematic if you think about microservices as an architecture um, that is um, being used more and more, where a microservice basically means that every, so the system cons consists now of these 
dozens or hundreds of small services. And each of these services is supposed to own their data. Right? There is no central database that holds all the data which the services talk to. Every services, service owns its data. That's what one of, one of the things microservices do in order to be able to scale, to evolve independently, to not be coupled, and so on. Yeah? If you have the central database instance, you, you lose all that. So how do you, in such a system, how do you even formulate a business process that needs to touch multiple of these microservices in a consistent fashion? That's a question that often comes up. And this is why, why I have it in here. Um, my hero here is Pat Helland. Um, has written two very good uh, articles, Life Beyond Distributed Transactions and Memories, Guesses and Apologies, uh, that you can or should read. So what is, this, uh, what is this saga pattern about? The saga pattern is also rather old. I didn't come up with any of these things. Um, this was published uh, when I was 10 years old. Garcia, Molina and Salem have written a paper with all caps sagas. I have not yet found out why it's all caps, but that's how it is. Um, where they uh, try to find a solution to this problem, they, they have these databases, and you need to go back to 1987. In, in 87, um, computers had one CPU with one core, and there was no superscalar design in 87. Uh, you had small memory and so on, but you already had databases. And in these databases, you had the problem, I mean, you had uh, locking and transactions and all these things because you had multiple clients to the same database. But um, you already had this problem that if you have a long-running transaction, so I start this and then I look at all the data and um, it takes an hour. During that time, other transactions that come in and that want to touch the same data, which is in this case all of them, uh, will just be blocked. They cannot proceed until that long-running transaction is done with its traversal. And uh, this is a problem because one query can take the database hostage and nothing makes progress anymore. So how do we fix this? The idea here is to break it up into smaller transactions. That's uh, what the text said on the previous uh, slide. And I will demonstrate this using the example of a fictitious bank transfer. Just to make sure everybody knows, this is not how bank transfers work. Nobody does them like this, uh, does them in a transaction, right? Um, bank transfers work in horrible ways by placing files on FTP servers in the end. So, but you don't want to know that. Uh, no, we'll assume here that we're doing a, bank, a, a, a transfer in a relational database using transactions and we want now to, to break this up. <laughs> so what, what we do here is, in order to break it up, uh, what we want to achieve is that we don't need to lock both accounts at the same time. That's the thing. We don't want deadlocks because of different things, so, and we don't want to have more locks than needed. So we break it up into two transaction, transactions. One transfers the money from the um, source account into a local working account uh, that we own. So there is no contention on this one. And then the second part transfers the money from the local working ac account into the destination. Now the, the question is, what if we cannot do the second part, but we have already done the first part? This is where the compensating action C1 comes in. So if we cannot get rid of the money and put it in the target account, because maybe it has been closed in the meantime, then we transfer it back. It's very simple in this case. And this is, this is a, an example that they discuss in the paper as well. So this is the basic, basic principle of how this works. You break up your long-running transactions in, in, into multiple steps. Each of these steps can be, tra can be transactional, but those transactions are kind of local. They are not that just big and distributed, so they run quickly. And uh, then you execute a sequence of them. And a saga is the sequence of transactions coupled with the corresponding compensating actions that you might need if you need to roll back the whole thing. Uh, there is one obvious um, behavioral change doing this as compared to having one big transaction, and that is 
two sagas running concurrently can see intermediate states. In this example of the bank account transfer, if I were to look at the whole table and sum up all accounts, um, money would be missing between steps T1 and T2. Right? Money is not in X anymore, but it's not yet in Y. You can fix this usually. So um, if you, uh, for, for this particular problem, the traversal that sums up all the things needs to take into account the local working accounts of these saga agents, and then everything is fine again, because T1 is a transaction, T2 is a transaction, so that should be fine. Um, yeah, so in general, uh, the paper analyzes uh, several um, aspects around this. In general, you, you have transactions T1, T2, T3, and if you need to roll them back, you need to execute their compensating actions in the reverse order, so first you undo the C3, and then C2, then C1. Now that's backward recovery. Um, there is one thing which is also very interesting, and that is if you uh, can store the system state, then there are certain cases where, where the failure was transient. So if it's not the bank account, the target bank account got closed, it's um, system not reachable right now or something, then you just, just uh, store a save point and try again later. So uh, you do step one, save the state, step two, save the state, and so on, which means that recovery can also just walk forward. This is um, very important if you uh, look at what we want to achieve here, namely if we want to have a resilient system, then it must be able to su survive machine crashes. And machine crashes means the machine must persist what it has done, and then it can, when it comes back up, Continue the process from there. Uh, but this is all, all theory. I have an actual uh, implementation of this process in Akka using persistent actors. So first of all, we have a trait account that uh, says an account can do withdraw and deposit actions that both return futures. Um, and we have a transfer command that is initially sent to our actor that we will write. Um, that says how much money goes from which account to which account. And then this actor will do things and have store its progress. And these are the events that can, have, uh, can happen. First, uh, the first event that we will emit is transfer has started, so that we know, we remember what we want to do. And the second one is once the money has been withdrawn, once the money has been deposited, and then possibly once it has rolled back. Now, how does this look like written as a persistent actor? So we call it transfer saga. It needs to have an ID. Uh, this ID will be in the persistence ID. So, so this, this saga has an identity. This saga is something that's active and that can be there only once. Um, and um, that, yeah, is, it manages this, this process. It's a thing that does a business process. And as such, it has an identity. It can talk to other components and can, can receive their replies. So that's basically the role it has. Initially, we wait for the start command. Uh, and then we persist that the transfer has started. Once it comes back from the journal, so we know it's safe on disk, uh, we execute the withdraw money step. Withdraw will be called on, on account X. So we, we withdraw from account X an amount. We give it this ID because, well, the system might crash. It might crash before it has the chance to persist that this step has already been done. So um, the account system that we send this request to needs to be able to deduplicate. It needs to know, oh, I've done what this saga wanted me to do already. So I will just say it's done without performing it again. When the reply comes back, we map it to money withdrawn, send it to this actor, and then switch state into await money withdrawn. Await money withdrawn reacts to this money withdrawn. It would also react to failure, but this is a minimal, minimal example, just to walk you through. Once we get this, we persist the knowledge that the money has been withdrawn, and once the persistence comes back, we say deposit money. Deposit money is quite analogous 
So we call the de deposit method on account Y. We map the results to money deposited, send it back to self, and then await the result of that one, which can be either money deposited and everything's happy. So we persist that and stop the saga. It's finished, has done its purpose. Or there was a status failure coming back, which means um, that we persist that we want to roll back. Once, uh, no, um, we map, map that to roll back, roll, rolled back, send that to self, and then um, await the rollback signal. Once uh, we get that, um, sorry, this explanation is too complicated. So once, if we get, if we get the failure back, we need to roll back. So we try to deposit the money in X. One we, once we get that back, that's the rolled back status that we persist to disk and stop the saga. Ah. <laughs> Needs more carbs. OK, so this clear so far? Yeah? So what happens is if the exo crashes before it, before it gets the money deposited? Well, so if, the, if the actor crashes, so it's then it's done. dead. But <laughs> then when it, when it restarts, it will recover. And this is uh, the other method that you need to implement in a persistent actor, namely what to do when it recovers. And when it, so w when you start this actor, it will use its ID to look up the log of the events that has, it has previously persisted. Initially, that log is empty, of course, but if it has run before and it just crashed, uh, then we will see what has happened in the past. So we get all of them that we might have persisted. If we get back a transfer started, we take note of the parameters that were in there. And um, for all the others, uh, we, um, so any other event, uh, we just keep track of what the last state was that we were in. And this means um, when we get the recovery completed, which means we have consumed all the events that were previously persisted, then we match on the last one. If there wasn't one, then we are still waiting for initialization. If there was only a transfer started, we start with the step of withdrawing money. If the money was already withdrawn, we start with depositing the money. If the money was already deposited or we already rolled back, we can just stop the actor right there because it was already finished. This may, as I said, do things twice because it may try to withdraw money and then crash. Right? So this means that you get at least once execution of all the things that it does, which makes sure that this saga actually runs to the end uh, eventually. Now, if you keep the system, re restart the system um, after it has crashed, then eventually it will get to the finished state. So that's how you would do a simulated bank transfer, but um, you can apply this principle to any business process. This, this thing here, you see that it has these steps of do something and then await the result and then decide what to do next. Now this, you can have a flow chart that describes a more complex process for anything you want and you implement all these boxes by states in your actor, you persist what you have done and uh, you can model any business process you want. It can be a long-running one, and it will guaranteed to be run. It will be resilient, and so on. Does this sound uh, like a good pattern? Yeah? Okay. I like it. Okay, so the Saga pattern is quite funny if you read the paper, uh, the Saga's paper, um, because some of these quotes you remember, they were written in 1987. But search for natural divisions of the work being performed. Yeah? Single responsibility principle. You put, yeah, do, the, do, do the different parts of the function of your application in different pieces, and you split your application along those lines. It is the database itself that is naturally partitioned into relatively independent components. This is exactly what uh, we are trying to um, to say when we, when we say microservices own their data. 
you split up the system into independent parts, and then you will notice that each one has its set of data that it's responsible for, that just belong to this piece of the function, and it's quite naturally, uh, comes quite naturally, this separation, once you think of it like that. The problem is, if you have previously worked in an environment where everything was stored in this huge central database, uh, then you are very used to not thinking in this modular fashion. You're thinking in this monolith uh, world where you have not split up the responsibilities. But, but once you start doing that, the data fall apart quite naturally. Um, the database and the saga should be designed so, so that data passed from one sub-transaction to the next via local storage is minimized. So uh, this, this translates to share nothing. I mean, you don't really want to, to propagate too many things. You don't want to send messages over the wire that are not really related to uh, what these components should be talking about. You want to confine the implementation details and, and keep them where they, where they belong and only um, have, have the overarching story be executed by the saga. Yeah, so this is, uh, I, I think, fully aligned with uh, simple components and isolation and so on and uh, all things reactive, which I found uh, quite reassuring. So the conclusion is reactive systems, by their very nature, uh, are distributed. Many forces drive us to make them distributed. And this requires some new architecture patterns where nearly everyone you look into, you recognize, is actually old. Now we are rediscovering things and putting them together. That's also what I think we state in the Reactive Manifesto. This is nothing new. That's the main criticism is we've been doing that for 30 years, right? Yeah, that's correct. But uh, it's, um, we need to write it up in this cohesive story um, to tell it to people. This is helped by some new code patterns. Um, some are actually new, but most of them, again, are not, are old, or old-ish, um, and abstractions that we can use. I mean, uh, conflict-free replicated data types are actually quite new, but that's, I think, the only big example that comes to mind. And the thing is, none of this, while fun, none of this is that easy. Yeah? You need to keep thinking, and that's uh, what I find so rewarding about this uh, field and this subject. Thanks. <laughs>